Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our GCP refresher. I'm Denise King, and I'm a project manager at the Emmons Corporation for the um, Clinical Coordinating Center. And I've been working um, with the CTN and with NIDA a little bit over a year. I've been at Emmons about eight years. Um, and with me is Laura Miasco, and I am the project manager for the DSC, the Data and Statistics Center. And I have been with the CTN for about five years now. So we welcome you uh, to the presentation today. So um, our objective today is that we're going to go over some principles and regulatory requirements for GCP, and we're also going to discuss some of um, the staff roles and responsibilities and some of the CCC and the DFC's responsibility as it relates to GCP and conducting quality trials. We're also going to look at some examples of GCP noncompliance that we've experienced and also some examples of corrective actions for some of these. And then we're going to discuss just some of the um, data management and some of the GCP trends that we have seen um, here uh, through the CCC and the DSC. All right, so we're going to start with the, uh, the GCP portion of it, and then uh, towards the end we'll go, you know, at the end of the second half of the presentation, Lauren, we'll talk more about the uh, man data management perspective. So what is GCP? Um, GCP is, is an international ethical and scientific quality standard. I mean, we've all, we're all familiar with this. And these standards um, assure that the design, the conduct, performance, the monitoring, recording, auditing, and analysis, and reporting of research studies involving human subjects have a certain standard. So GCP is kind of our assurance that if we follow GCP, that this, the uh, study is being conducted with these in mind. Um, governments from around the world transpose the GCP standards into their own regulations, and um, depending on the country, obviously we're in the U.S., you are required just to, while you're um, conducting studies, to adhere to those GCP standards. So GCDMP is very similar to GCP. It's just a collection of data management standards. So, and along the same lines that Denise spoke to, it's really just ensuring that all trials are conducted according to these standards and that um, things are consistent and done properly as far as data collection and data reporting. You know, in the end, we're, our goal of any study is to really present data and present results. And so through conducting a study um, using the GCDMP standards, we're trying to ensure that uh, the results are all valid and true and reported um, well. Okay, so what are some of the research studies involving human subjects? Um, here we are all familiar with the CTM, we're all familiar with the um, clinical trials, which um, are interventions, usually randomized interventions, not always though, where we're um, adhering to some kind of a clinical protocol. But it also includes laboratory studies on tissue samples, um, some epidemiology and behavioral research studies, which the CTM is, is familiar with uh, as well. And then also some of the marketing research studies. Sometimes, you know, the phase four or the post-marketing studies that are done also have to also involve human subjects. But all types of studies that are conducted would really benefit from the use of GCP. So where is GCP applied? It's applied in private industry. You know, pharma companies apply the standards of GCP. Obviously, NIH does, the CDC. Um, government, uh, research institutions, research institutions affiliated with universities or any kind of a private research institution, and research studies that are conducted in uh, private practice. Um, as stated earlier, these are internationally adopted standards. Um, you know, specific countries, you know, use these standards and to uh, formulate regulations. And um, they only, in terms of the, the general principle of GCP is the same throughout all the regulations, but some of them are only, there are minor differences between countries. But the, the, the standard is expected to be used universally. So why do we have GCP? We have GCP to basically assure the public that we're protecting the rights, the safety, and the well-being of all trial subjects. Another big part of GCP is making sure that 
we are producing credible data based on scientific quality standards. So it's twofold. It's making sure that we're protecting the rights, safety, and well-being of the subjects, and that also the data that we're producing is of high quality. So what are some of the entities um, involved in human research protection? There's, there's several. There's the international standards, which is the ICH, the International Conference of Harmonization, um, of which FDA is a member. So they have drafted um, E6, which was, was drafted a while ago, and from this, GCP guidance are formed um, and regulations are formed um, through the, um, with the FDA and also with other international regulatory bodies. Then we also have federal. Um, the FDA, along with OHRP and the NIH, as well as other parts of HSS, HH, HHS, also um, issue guidance documents regarding human subject protection with OHARP, taking the lead on providing clarification and guidance on the topics. OHARP also develops the educational programs and the materials. They maintain the regulatory oversight and they provide advice on ethical and regulatory issues in biomedical and uh, behavioral research. So we obviously those are the, the U.S. federal standards. And then obviously locally we also have institutional IRB policies and instructions. So you know the, the local IRBs obviously follow the, the uh, principles of GCP, but then they also have some of their own policies that are that need to be adhered to when you're conducting a research study, you know, underneath this particular institutional IRB. And then, of course, lastly, we've got the, the study, which is the implementation of all the GCPs. So we've got, um, a you know, we've got international, federal, and local uh, policies that all work together so that the clinical trial does implement GCP so that we assure the rights of the uh, participants as well as the qual high quality data. So some of the highlights of GCP. Um, you know, the ethical principles are the most important thing when it comes to conducting human subjects research. Part of it is um, developing a scientifically sound and detailed protocol, and within that protocol there's a risk-benefit assessment. Um, also in many of the uh, informed consents, there's a lot of those risks and benefits are displayed in the informed consent so that the participant is aware of those. And um, like I said earlier, the um, individual subject rights and safety prevail over all other interests when it comes to GCP. Um, other highlights include approvals, so um, you need to have IRB, um, local IRB or ethical committee approval depending on the country that you're working in. Um, and also you need to have the medical care that's administered in a clinical trial needs to be by a qualified physician or someone designated by the physician but who also has the qualifications to conduct the medical care, obviously, like nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, et cetera. And then it also states that all the staff that is participating in the study are qualified um, by education and training to conduct the study. So a big part of, as you know, this, our training in the CTN is that we, we try to at the beginning of a study, um, train everybody uh, locally, you know, by the local no the nodes as well as at your site level, to make sure that everyone is thoroughly trained to conduct the duties of the study. And this training isn't just at the beginning of the study; it's throughout the study because, you know, at the beginning of the study, you're you're trained on the entire protocol, but you're not actually working on parts of the protocol till later on. But it could be up to six months, a year later. So that's why it's important to continuously train the staff, both, you know, the monitors and the local QA monitors, as well as the CCC, as well as the staff, just to make sure that everyone is still um, up to speed on the um, required procedures for the protocol. Um, other highlights include informed consent for every subject, and as you know, this is, we monitor 100% of informed consents that are taken. We want to look at the process of informed consent, as well as any kind of documentation that's required um, both by the CTN and also by the local IRBs. Um, we want to make sure that subject confidentiality is protected and that the data is handled, recorded, handled, and stored to allow accurate reporting, interpretation, and verification. So we're going to look at the procedures set out by 
the protocol and the MLP for the particular study and we'll make, to make sure that you're collecting data that, according to the study protocols, keeping the GCP principles in, um, as the foremost uh, principle. Um, another part of GCP is, has to do with investigational products. So there are many regulations involved with the manufacturing of investigational products and it's important that um, companies that are manufacturing the product adhere to those standards. And there have been many uh, FDA audits into uh, GMP facilities making sure that what they're producing, they are actually adhering to the standards. Um, in addition to the standards for the facility, um, you know, study personnel are um, required to store their investigational product according to the, according to the protocol and to the manual of operations. Um, and with this, we would, um, depending on the study, there would be um, either local procedures um, that need to be used when handling IP or the study procedures in conjunction with the local procedures. Um, this is, this is, IP is one of those um, parts of GCP where it's very easy when, when an FDA auditor comes in. There have been a lot of sightings uh, recently with the use of investigational product. Um, I like to say that it's this seemingly simple process um, in terms of accountability, recording it and, and keeping an accurate inventory, yet it is, there, is a, there are many opportunities for errors to occur. And you know, because of that, um, we are actually going to have a um, seminar in the future to discuss um, investigational product procedures. In terms of the adoption of GCP principles, um, as we as stated earlier, um, governments and government agencies adopt these principles, um, as well as some of the um, industry organizations and manufacturers also adopt these. Um, you know, we are a contract research organization. There are many contract research organizations, and they also adhere to these principles as well, as well as professional societies, um, regulatory. Um, clinical, et cetera, also adhere to the principles of GCP. So we've all heard about, you know, we're all, everyone here, this, I'm sure this is probably, you know, double digit time that we've heard about GCP, but how do we actually implement it and what does it mean? I think that it's important to understand, you know, we have all of these policies and these regulations, but what do they actually mean? What is the real value and how do we implement these? Well. One of the ways that we implement GCP is by developing an, um, some written standard procedures that need to be followed by not just the investigators and the um, study team at the research sites, but also by the sponsors, um, also the monitors. You know, we have procedures that our monitors have to follow that adhere to GCP principles. Um, also, data managers and IT staff, all of our staff here have um, standard operating procedures that they are to adhere to, all with the underlying um, GCP principles. So it's not just the study staff, but it's everybody else that's associated with the, with the clinical trial. And in addition to that, there's also regulatory authorities that also have to use written procedures when they are um, conducting audits and doing some of their work. So uh, it doesn't all fall on the site staff. We all have a responsibility to adhere to these principles as well. So some of the ways in which we can um, implement these and adhere to these is by um, carefully planning clinical trials. Um, it's very important at the beginning of a trial to come up with the detailed instructions and procedures um, that the uh, trial site staff needs to follow during the conduct of the trial. You know, startup is a very uh, hectic time Typically, there is very tight deadlines that um, are implemented not just by the sponsors but by you know a number of other people that need to you know that are important to adhere to. But also part of that phase is actually thinking about some of the things that need to be carefully thought out and where detailed procedures need to be written. And it's really important to put that to do that stage to do enter that phase and to think about those things at the beginning of your trial. And it's always, you know, there's not a trial that I've worked on ever where hindsight is in 2020 where you realize 
a couple months in, a year in, that, oh, I should have done, you know, should have thought of it this way or, or whatever, and then you update your procedures, and that's fine. You can't possibly come think of everything at the beginning that you're going to encounter, but it's also very important to put the time in at the beginning of a trial to make sure that you have what you need, to, that the site staff has what they need, and the, as well as the monitors and, and all other parties in, in participating have what they need to, to adhere to these standards. Um, also, inclusion exclusion criteria, making sure that they're precise, um, making sure that, um, you know, that they, they meet the needs of the study, but also that they're not too precise, that it may exclude a lot of people and, and, and there may be difficulty with enrolling into the study. Also, what's very important is clarifying the safety and the efficacy endpoints, so taking the time to make sure that those are clearly um, you know, enumerated to the to the respective parties, the, the, the investigators and the site staff, um, so that they are aware of what they are, and also so that the um, the the CCC staff, all staff members are aware of those as well when they're conducting and monitoring the trial. Um, part of this, as I stated earlier, is to make sure that we inform. Um, and train all the investigators. You know, we do that at the beginning of a trial, but like I said, we want to do that throughout the trial, not just at the beginning. Um, we want to make sure, like I said earlier, the staff is adequately trained. Um, we want to make sure that everyone's qualified for the position. You know, everybody comes from a different perspective, but just making sure that we're all consistent in how we want to implement procedures. Um, and then also communication both with the sponsor and with representatives of the sponsor, like the DSC and the CCC, for example. It's very important. I would rather have, you know, people ask questions um, if they're confused than have them, you know, have staff um, do something that they're not sure of and then find out later that they perhaps weren't doing it correctly. So it's really important that we keep up communication um, and then also following the, the um, protocol and the SOPs. Okay, um, documentation in a clinical trial is very important. Um, obviously, we talked about the documentation of the consent process. Um, this is a big thing with FDA as well. And I, you know, from my experience working with the CTN, I think that the sites do a really good job of, of documenting the consent process. You know, it's important to document any questions that the uh, participant had, that you, you know, the whole consent process as well as that they were received a copy of the consent after the after they signed the consent. Um, um, it's also important to make sure that anything that requires documentation, for example, if a, if a paper CRF is required for a particular um, procedure or for a particular assessment, that you actually collect that on paper before entering it into EDC. Um, Adverse event reporting is also very important. Um, I, you know, through my experience, I think we do a good job with this as well. You know, in terms of adverse event reporting, I think it's important. Every protocol is different in terms of the types of adverse events collected. So it's, um, I always stress to, to uh, clinical staff to refer to your protocol if you're not sure of whether or not an AE needs to be reported either locally or through EDC. Um, also, entering your study data on time, the DSC does a lot of um, back-end and front-end checks on study data, as we all know. They're very good at that. And the sooner you get your data in, you know, the sooner they can implement these and identify any potential issues or anything to help you um, in the future. Um, keeping your documentation of all of your annual IRBs, um, keeping the IRB up to date on changes is also very important. Um, you know, we typically remind you of, of when your continuing review is done, and I think that, you know, the, IR, the staff does a really good job of, of, of um, submitting to IRB documentation in a timely way and storing that in the regulatory binders. And then also just um, having the staff and the study subjects informed of any trial progress. If there's any changes to the study you're required to, that, that require communication to the participants, um, you know, you're required to inform them. Typically, this is done with a modification in this informed consent, but there may be other instances where you need to communicate something for, for, to them where it may not be in the consent for some reason. 
so the sponsor also has obligations to adhere to GCP. Um, these include quality assurance and quality control. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but um, you know, we here at the CCC, as well as some of the local QA monitors, do a lot of quality assurance. Um, but it's also at your individual sites. You're required to do some of your own quality assurance and quality control. Um, also, depending on if it's an investigational product, um, they're required to keep an investigation, investigator's brochure, and it's required to be updated um, with any uh, updates to clinical trials or results of clinical trials. And any updates need to be uh, communicated to the investigators and to the local IRBs. Um, a sponsor, another obligation of the sponsor is making sure that the test article or investigational product is manufactured under GMP and adhering to GMP standards. There's a number of different requirements for that, including stability testing of the investigational product, you know, testing in various environments, making sure that over time that, that the uh, investigational product continues to retain that effectiveness. Um, so there's a variety of, of other documentation that's required for investigational product by the sponsor and can be reviewed by the FDA and, and actually required for review submission to the FDA in the annual report. Um, regulatory procedures, or uh, I'm sorry, regulatory approvals are also um, required by the sponsor, whether it be, you know, FDA, um, et cetera. Um, of monitoring and auditing study progress, we do this on site, but we also do this through the DSC. We've got the TPR, I think is a great um, tool, has a great, a, a really useful report that, that give you a good oversight of what's going on um, in terms of study progress using a bunch of, you know, various different um, uh, parameters. And I, you know, I encourage everyone to, to, I'm sure that you all look at this on a regular basis, but if you don't, you know, look at that on a regular basis because this gives you a good insight into what's going on with a particular study. And then also, um, you know, the sponsor is required to uh, submit reports to investigators with any updates in regards to the study as well as to any regulators, to the regulators as well. So in terms of, of quality assurance, um, uh, these are planned systemic activities uh, conducted to ensure that the trial is performed um, and that everything is done according to the protocol and any other standards as well as the fact that you're adhering to um, GCP and other uh, regulatory requirements. So um, as I stated earlier, the, the CCC does quality assurance audits with their monitors, but then also you have your local nodes that do quality assurance visits that, that look at more of your procedures, making sure you're adhering to your own um, standard operating procedures as well as any study procedures. And I think and together, um, you know, with the, the on-site monitoring, it's, it's very comprehensive and I think that it does a good, the monitoring for these studies is, is very thorough and it does a good job of catching any issues. And I think, you know, from my perspective, it's really important, you know, monitoring and QA auditing, um, they're really there to help the sites and to help um, the sponsor and I know that um, sometimes people get um, nervous when it comes to these things, but really we're your partners and we're there to help to make sure that, you know, you're doing things the way you need to and if you need a refresher on something, we're there to help you to provide that additional training to make sure that um, you're adhering to the, um, to the procedures. And if for some reason you're not, then, you know, we just document it, we do some retraining, you do some retraining and, and then you move on. But um, it's really, you know, these are great processes to have and it assures that, the, that, you know, that we are ultimately producing good quality data. In addition to that, we've got the DSC with all of the monitoring that they do of the study data. And I think that between the two, it's a very comprehensive quality assurance program that is offered by the CTN. So like I said, um, quality assurance is not just uh, with the monitors and with the local QA staff, but it's also at your, at the individual research site. You know, different, you know, sites have different procedures for assuring quality assurance. Some are required by local IRBs and some are just, you know, site specific. But I've seen over the years, not just through the CTN, but over the years working 
Um, here at Emmis, I've seen a lot of great quality assurance procedures at sites to make sure that um, procedures are being followed, that the data is clean, that you're, you know, conducting assessments according to the protocol, et cetera. So, you know, that, those also help. So not just, you know, the, the external QA, but also any internal processes that you follow to make sure that, that um, you're producing sound data and also protecting the rights of human subjects. So like I said earlier, um, you know, the purpose of monitoring visits is to assure that the rights and the well-being of human participants are protected. Um, it's also making sure that the trial data is accurate, complete, and verifiable, and that we are, and that the study is being conducted according to the protocol, um, including any amendments as well as GCP and other regulatory requirements. Um, uh, the, the regulations state that monitoring is required before we do on-site initiation visits, but we also do remote initiation visits depending on the protocol and the experience of the particular site, um, and also depending on the proximity to the investigator's meeting. Um, you know, some studies, you, not necessarily in the CTM, but some studies will, you know, hold an investigator's meeting prior to study launch and consider that an initiation visit for experienced sites that they're familiar with. Okay, um, also monitoring, uh, let me go back one, uh, monitoring is required um, during the trial um, and then also after the trial. We typically do a closeout visit. Sometimes we will combine the last interim and the closeout visit, so we'll wrap up some issues re regarding with the study and also do some closeout issues as well. Um, closeout um, visits can also be conducted remotely but for um, a lot of the studies we do on-site, especially if there's investigational product, we want to do final accountability of that so that either it can be um, destroyed locally or sent off to the drug distribution center for destruction. Okay, so like I said earlier, these are um, all CTM studies um, undergo monitoring by the CCC. Um, you know, I just mentioned what the types of, of visits that we do. Um, the, after a monitoring visit, within two weeks of the visit, you all receive reports, and these get filed with the um, CTP, the local node, NIDA, and the lead investigator. So um, these reports detail what um, occurred at the visit, any addition, whether there was any additional training, any discussion about the data quality. Um, as most of you know, we now have an electronic site visit report. Um, which is going to assure that there's consistency between visits and between monitors and between sites. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, and like I said earlier, um, monitoring, we're here to assist and to help. So, you know, it's um, our, you know, our responsibility to assure that you're doing um, a good job with adhering to the protocol and to GCP standards, but also that we're protecting the participants and that we're conducting good research for NIDA. Okay, so um, some more information about doing GCP. Um, as we all know, you're required to keep essential documents at the site at your, in your regulatory binders. Um, it's important that you keep these up to date. Um, it's very easy to get behind in this, and then it becomes a very uh, large task getting everything into the binder. So just making sure that you have, um, you keep your updated documents, licenses, or CVs, or any kind of training documentation for new staff members, you know, keeping your log, your, your um, responsibilities and delegation log current, and so that when there's monitoring visits and the reg binders reviewed, that it's as current as possible so it doesn't require a lot of work on your part after the visit. Um, you know, for studies that are conducted under IND, you know, we always have to think about, you know, if the FDA came in, you know, would, would this be an acceptable binder? Would this be, would the research site be, you know, adhering to standards in preparation for an audit? You know, if, if an audit ever, you know, if, the, if you ever were contacted by an FDA auditor and told that you had, that they were on their way, um, you know, we are here to help, obviously, um, 
we would assist you in the preparation of that FDA audit. We also have quality assurance staff here at MS that would also assist you in preparation for that audit. Um, on another study that I uh, worked on not under the CTN, we had an FDA audit of a site and the auditor was actually there for three weeks. Um, it was quite stressful for the study staff, but fortunately it all worked out, but we learned a lot from that audit in terms of how to prepare um, sites for FDA audits and you know um, what to do from, from a sponsor perspective as well. Also, keeping um, re you're required to keep the documentation after you close out a study according to the sponsor's standards. Um, you, if you have to move that to a storage facility, you need to have that written up so that if the, the um, study binders needed to be reviewed in a time, you know, it, it quickly by an auditor or by you know NIDA or what you know any other kind of um, regulatory body that you would be able to have that you would have quick access to those in case they need to be reviewed. Okay, and then lastly, um, more on uh, doing GCP is um, making sure that there's objectivity in research, and this is by um, trying to reduce any kind of bias, which is why we have um, disclosure of uh, financial disclosures and conflicts of interest to make sure that there's no um, underlying uh, bias when co um, conducting it. And then also that's why we have independent uh, data safety monitoring boards. They review the data objectively and um, they're able to, to make uh, assessments, make recommendations based on what they see, and they're very important into keeping, um, protecting human subjects as well as keeping um, objectivity in research. Okay, and like I said before, is, is another, you know, I've said this many times, is just making sure that investigators and staff are trained on the study procedures as well as local procedures and um, data recording methods, um, which Lauren will talk about in, in a few moments in terms of what our standards are for doing that. And then, um, you know, obviously the underlying principle is to adhere to G, uh, principles of GCP. Okay, so we, as I said earlier, here are some of the, um, the CFRs for clinical research under Title 21. And that includes um, 21 CFR section 312 is the, um, the CFR for INDs for drugs and biologics. Um, section 50 is the protection of human subjects. 54 is financial disclosures. 56 is um, IRBs. And then also 45 CFR 46 is the common rule. So um, I have actually over the years read these many times. Um, they're interesting. Um, I refer to them frequently, if I'm, especially if I'm writing any kind of procedures, I'll go to these um, to assist with that. And then obviously we have the ICH guidelines, which are very easily accessible on the internet. You just have to punch in, punch in ICH guidelines and I'll bring up a website that has them all you know, by uh, topic that you can um, look at. Okay, so some conclusions for GCP. Um, you know, like I said earlier, these are international um, standards, so they apply not just to here in the U.S., but also um, overseas in other countries. Um, and you know, with, with the paramount standard of protecting human subjects um, and also assuring that we have quality data. Um, you know, the, the using GCP, the principles and following the GCP, um, is also um, helps with marketing approvals for you know drugs that are under IND that eventually will be approved, and then it also is used for uh, approved drugs that need to get um, treatment indications. You know, uh, a, a drug will be you know it will might be approved for a certain indication, and then it, there's another IND for the drug to get it approved for an additional indication. So that is also used. Uh, GCP principles would apply. So the take-home messages um, is to follow, you know, is for, you know, in conjunction with the sponsor to prepare written procedures, but then also to follow them, to follow the protocol, uh, to make sure that you're familiar with some of the safety rules and the safety uh, recording of safety events for the protocol, uh, maintaining confidentiality, participant confidentiality. Um, 
and integrity, making sure that the, you're uh, producing credible research data, and um, knowing that for investigators, make sure that you're aware of what your responsibilities are as an investigator. Okay, so now um, I'm going to take uh, a little, I'm going to take a break from lecturing and we're going to just, I'm going to just present some scenarios that I have um, personally encountered on monitoring visits both uh, through the CTN and also through other projects. But uh, the, the scenarios that I'm going to present um, I've seen, have been ones that have been seen um, in the CTN. So I want to, um, and for this you can use your chat function. Um, I'm going to present a scenario and then if you have any comments or you ha think that you know the answer, you can put it into the chat and, and I, I, well, you guys will probably all come up with the answers. But um, a research trial required uh, negative HEP A and B prior to randomization um, and as part of the requirement, the investigator has to sign those reports prior to the participant randomizing and that's to assure that they were reviewed and to assure that those labs were within the, um, they were negative uh, prior to randomization. So when the monitor came to the site, um, she noticed that the lab results for three of the randomized participants had never been signed. Um, and it was three and six months into the trial and the, the labs prior to randomization had never been signed by the investigators. So does anyone know, anyone have an idea as to what, uh, what should be done next? Um, by the site. If you have um, any suggestions, you can put them into the chat. I see someone's got their hand raised. If you have, oh, there we go. Report protocol, be very good. That, those are great. Should be added. Late entry signed by them. Those are really good suggestions. And yes, that would definitely be a protocol deviation, file a protocol deviation. Really good. Participants were disqualified. Um, in this particular, somebody put in that the participants were disqualified from the study. Um, it, it would depend on the situation. If, if indeed they didn't, um, you know, they were HEP positive and there was a significant safety issue. That would be a decision, especially if it was a halting criteria, that would be a decision made whether or not the, the participant would need to stop the investigational product. Um, but filing a protocol deviation is, is absolute, that was, that's correct. I'll consult with coordinator to find out any review that didn't happen. Get to PI to review and sign the thing. These are great answers. Um, so what you'd want to do is have the investigators sign and date the labs with the current date. So that's correct. They just would be signed and dated with the current date. Do not backdate anything ever. Just sign and date it with the current date. And then in this case, and somebody mentioned something similar to this, is to have some kind of a corrective and preventative action plan that, you know, perhaps there was a breakdown in the procedures. Maybe there was a procedure prior to randomization that the site had or that was, you know, a protocol procedure and that was not followed for whatever reason. But, or maybe there needs to be a procedure um, in place for this that, you know, maybe there, uh, there's a stack of labs put on, you know, whatever the pr procedure would be so that to alert the physician to make sure that either the, the um, investigator or the sub-investigator or anyone else who's delegated to do so signs those labs before randomization if there's some process in place. So you don't want to backdate, you just want to move forward. So obviously, you know, you'd have to report those to the local IRB and to the sponsor and they would make a decision about that participant um, and then uh, implement some kind of a corrective action plan to assure that it doesn't happen in the future. So um, typically what a lot of um, a fallback is, is, is a note to file about that. and and. You know, a note to file um, in a lot of cases is, re is not necessary. And in fact, the FDA does not like note to file because it alerts them that there is a problem. When you write a note to file explaining what you did wrong, you're, you're basically saying, I did this wrong. Not that that's bad, but it just makes them dive in a little bit more. And I think um, the thing about the note to file is sometimes people feel that 
a notifile might exonerate or, you know, it kind of lessens what happened, but it doesn't. And the most important thing when you have an incident like this come up is that you implement some kind of a corrective action plan. Um, when, you know, if, a, if an auditor came in um, and saw that this had happened and that the investigator signed him late, but then you guys, you know, the site implemented a corrective action plan and that moving forward, it never happened again. It would be written up as a finding, but it would not necessarily be something that would issue a 483, for example, if it was an FDA audit. It would be written up as a finding, but it would also be stated that a corrective action was in place. So the same thing would hold true if we, as monitors, came to a research site and saw this, but saw that you had implemented a process for this, that you had filed a deviation, you had informed the IRB, you had informed the sponsor, but you, you did a process moving forward, you know, that is the, the correct action to take. What happened in the past happened in the past. You can't undo it. And, and writing a note to file doesn't necessarily undo it all. So, you know, we encourage um, you as well as our own staff to, to avoid excessive use of the note to file. You know, when, if a monitor finds it and it's, it's documented in a monitoring report, that's documentation that, that something had occurred. Um, you don't necessarily have to write a note to file for everything. So, but those are great answers. Thank you for your participation. And here's another one. Um, this is uh, for participation as well, so you can type your answers in chat. Um, the MOP outlines the procedures for performing informed consent and documenting the process. The monitor discovered that there was no documentation of informed consent process in three charts. I don't know, the three seems to be a common number here. Um, so what would you do next? So if the monitor came in and said, I noticed that there was no documentation for uh, participants one, two, and three of the consent process or that they received a consent. Does anyone have any suggestions as to what to do? Late entry, no uh, protocol deviation, no to file protocol deviation, submit to IRB. These are all good things. Get the consent. So everything, um, reporting it to the IRB is, is, is good, especially if this was a requirement, if it was written in the, this is in the MOP, but it still may be considered a protocol deviation. Um, you know, it may be required, if, you know, the pro protocol dictated or the study dictated a particular process that needs to be filed. Um, um, so it may need to be a, uh, it may need to be a, a, a uh, deviation. We consent the participants, retrain the staff, provide uh, CAPA. So those are all, let's see here. So some of the suggestions I had is retrain the study staff, just like, just like I had said. So what was done, you know, I, I do not recommend, you know, writing a note today saying on uh, January 1st, you know, Jane Brown consented the participant and gave him a copy because doing that does not change the fact that it didn't happen at the time. So I, I don't necessarily recommend doing that. So what I do recommend is you move forward with new procedures. You retrain the study staff and you document your training. It's very important that if you do any kind of retraining, whether it's um, within your study site or a monitor does the retraining, that you document it all so that you have that um, in place that you were, you were trained on those particular procedures. Also, as part of a corrective action, you might want to implement um, that somebody go behind somebody else and check the um, informed consent and the documentation as it happens. So perhaps on that day, you have somebody else that did not, was not involved in the consent process go behind um, the person that consented and make sure that their documentation is the way that it should be. So. I think you guys all understand it, but the big thing is moving forward. What will we do to correct the pro you know correct the issue identified? What can we do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? Um, and I, I just wanted to bring to your attention. I don't know if you've ever um, done this before. If you've ever looked at FDA warning letters, um, this is the hyperlink to them. Um, they're very uh, interesting and kind of. 
uh, alarming at the same time to look at. Um, I encourage you to take a look and see at some of the things that that have um, that auditors have come across um, at, through an SDA audit. You know, this is just a screenshot of the of the um, reading room for warning letters. You can get them by year. You can get them by topic by um, issuing office. You can put in CEDAR, which is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And you can take a look at some of the warning letters that are out there. They're redacted, so you don't necessarily see the study name or the product name, whatever. But I encourage you to take a look at some of these, um, you know, and, and get to get an example of some of the warning letters that have been issued by the FDA. Um, I've taken some um, language out from, um, this is from two different warning letters. This is exactly from the warning letter. Um, you failed to ensure that the investigation was a cut conducted according to the investigational plan, um, which is you didn't follow the protocol is what this is saying right here. Um, you failed to obtain informed consent in accordance with the provisions of 21 CFR Part 50. Um, in this particular warning letter, um, there were some procedures performed prior to the consent process, which we all know you cannot do. You have to get the consent and then perform study procedures. So this um, in that particular case, that was why this was written up. And then this was you failed to personally conduct or supervise the clinical investigation. This one was involved the study staff. There had something had happened with the study staff was not um, had not followed the protocol or was not following some kind of procedures, um, and they were it, it was you know unfortunately you know that falls onto the investigator if the study staff um, didn't follow and, and there was no uh, corrective action and was not caught, et cetera. So. Anyway, so in your free time, I encourage you to look at some of these letters. They're, they're pretty interesting. Also, they have like um, letters, all sorts from different departments too that I find interesting, like um, audits of facilities, of GMP facilities, of, of uh, food facilities, et cetera. So it's, a, it's an interesting part of the website. Okay, does anyone have uh, any questions on GCP? Um, or anything else before we move to some of the data management portion of the discussion? Well, I, I thank you for your time. Um, and with that, we will move on to uh, Lauren's portion. Um, so, you know, I'll be covering some GC DMP, and so it's uh, good, good clinical data management practices. And so we'll be going over overall data standards and SOPs for, for data. Um, I just like to put a little cartoon. You know, it says, next time, be more careful where you put the decimal point. Um, you know, data is really one of those things that you have to be super detail-oriented about. Um, if you, you know, flip numbers or if you forget the decimal point, you know, it's, it's a big difference. And, and a lot of times, you know, not having that diligence um, can cause more serious errors. So, um, data is actually something that I know, you know, of course I love, I was a data manager, um, but I know a lot of times people look at data as something that's kind of more mundane and putting data into the system can kind of be tedious. So um, I know that, you know, it's one of those processes that, you know, takes a lot of effort, but it's something that is really important to the validity of the trial and making sure that, you know, your result, results are you know, accurately reflect what happened during the conduct of the trial. And, you know, when, you know, at the end of the day, when we go to implement these procedures, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, what we've recorded and what, what our analysis is, is actually something that can help people, you know, long term and, and, and is valid. So, you know, paying attention to, to your data is, is very important. So, you know, as part of, CCDMP, you know, making sure things are done correctly, you know, the words fraud and misconduct are kind of thrown around. So when you hear these, you probably think, oh, wow, it's really a more serious thing, and it's, it's the case where, you know, uh, an investigator had one participant and then kind of threw around the data and made stuff up and turned it into 15 participants to make their, um, you know, their enrollments look good. It's, you know, of course, those are the really bad fraud and misconduct uh, examples, but it really encompasses the smaller things, too. So, yes, it's intentional wrongdoing, 
or intentional deception or any kind of falsification, but it also is forgetting to do things and kind of doing things like, oh, nobody will catch me and it's, you know, it's not a big deal. Oh, I forgot to do this yesterday. Oh, I'll just put yesterday's date because it's only one day later and I recognize it now and I know I was supposed to do it yesterday, so it's not a big deal. Actually, it is a big deal and, you know, it's something to really be conscious of. You know, it's a, the smaller things really add up and are a good indication of the bigger things going on. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have good results in the end of a study and we love to have a good outcome and we love to have, you know, a, a new drug or a new intervention that works. But in the end, it's more important that the study is conducted appropriately and that the data that we've collected are actual data on real participants um, and an actual data that you've collected. So some examples that we've seen, you know, uh, I've heard of either in the CTN or in other projects um, we've worked with, um, some examples of, of con misconduct and fraud. Um, would be, you know, creating a source document for a missed assessment. So if, you know, somebody comes in and they were supposed to do a timeline fallback, but they forgot to do it, it's, you know, it, it's okay. You know, it, there's, I know it's something that you probably feel bad about and you know you were supposed to do, but you realize you missed it. And, you know, putting down that it was a missed assessment in the end, if you think about how much data we have for a trial, even for something that in most cases, you know, time on fallback is primary outcome, it's vital data. You know, you'll hear us over and over again say, whatever you do, at a very minimum, collect your primary outcome. So yes, it's really important and, you know, it's unfortunate that it wasn't done, but if you make up data for it or if you know that when you talk to the participant, you know, you had a conversation with him and he was like, oh, yeah, I've been clean. I was great this week. I didn't go to parties. I didn't see my friends. You know, it, you know, you can't just assume that that would be a no-use time period for him and create a source document um, without actually doing the assessment. So it's something that, you know, you have to be cautious of, and you know, it's 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 something to be mindful of. So, um, you know, creating the source document from something missed um, is just an example. Um, if you uh, throw away a source document for something. So if you know that something is supposed to be direct data entry and for whatever reason you created the source document, um, you throw it away, that's also misconduct. Um, that's the first point of data collection and for us that's important. Um, other examples are things like if you have knowledge that an AE occurred but you did not report it um, either you know, in the system or on, on your logs where it's supposed to be, um, that's, that's also really important. You know, even if it's something that's small and you think probably wasn't a big deal, um, it's still important to get that information to us um, and the investigators and then they're the ones that determine how important it is. Um, Denise mentioned this earlier, but backdating the review of eligibility criteria. So, you know, if you forgot to do something before randomization um, and you realize it later, Whatever you do, don't put the date back on when it was supposed to be done. Um, I know it's tempting, and especially if you only, you know, realize it just in-house and nobody else saw it. Um, but, you know, these things a lot of times do have a way of coming out, um, and, and they're found out somehow, some way. And so if you just, you know, admit to the fact that it was done, find a way to fix it, make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, the, the repercussions really aren't that big. So some other issues that we've found um, that are trends across the CTN um, would be issues uh, regarding Advantage EDC. So this is our electronic data capture system. Um, and one of the most important parts of the system is that it's 21 CFR um, Part 11 compliant. So Denise earlier mentioned all the code of regulations. And the one that really applies to the data side is the Part 11 compliance. And so what that means really is that EDC tracks everything you do in it. So if you add data or you delete data or you modify something, it puts it down that um, it was done under your username 
and when you did it. So if you have you know, one username and password that's shared across the entire site, it looks like you know, the one person did all of it. So it's the same thing as like if you had a stack of you know, papers and you just put them in front of someone and they just signed blindly. Um, it's the same thing. So it's really important to make sure that each person has their own ID. And a part of that goes along with the GCP standards of the fact that you have to have somebody be trained and appropriately qualified to use the system. So we don't want somebody who has no idea what they're doing go in and mess up data that you've entered and then you know, we issue queries or we try to figure out what's going on and you know, because they don't know what they're doing, you cause more of a disaster than, um, than you need. So you know, making sure that each person has their own password is important. So I've had cases where you know, we have a coordinator at a site and somebody is coming to replace him and he says to me, oh, no big deal, I'll just give him my username and password and when I leave he can use it. Well, that's not a good idea. So, you know, when the new person comes on, he has to do, you know, um, the training, which is for most cases watching a demonstration of EDC, um, and then he does a practicum to verify um, that he knows what he's doing in the system. And then he'll have his own data. So then we also have a record in the system of when the original person left and stopped doing data entry, and when the new person came on and you know, that's also really important later on at the end of the study when we're doing data cleaning. We know who to go to to ask questions. So, um, you know, if the first person's left, we know that it's harder to get answers to our integrity queries um, because we can decipher which person's responsible for, for what they've done. So if we find that some assessment is collected wrongly and, you know, data is assumed, you know, we, we know who to ask and how to fix it. So. You know, and also, um, on that matter, applies to ePro. So I know ePro is a very new thing. It's, um, for those of you who haven't used it in your trials, it stands for Electronic Participant Reported Outcomes. And so what it is is that each participant has their own username and password to enter data into EDC. So it's all self-report. It's um, the initial point of data collection right where they're at. And so it allows us to track that an assessment was done, um, you know, based on self-report and, and, you know, without any inter, um, intervention by the RA. So if for some reason, you know, their password's not working, um, you know, I've seen cases where an RA will then just be like, oh, well, we still want it in the system, so no big deal. I'll sign under my name, and then you go ahead and I'll give you the computer and you, you complete the assessment. Well. To us, then, that looks like the RA completed the assessment, not the participant. And so it kind of compromises the integrity of knowing that it's self-report. So in those cases, what we've asked people to do is to give the participant a piece of, you know, a, a, a store, paper source document um, to administer the assessment, and then that way, you know, we know that it was done based on the participant being alone and not knowing the RA, um, you know, bias, and so we're able to capture that it was um, done solely based on the participant's self-report. So it's also an important thing to think about, and I know ePro is new and, and, and coming across, so I know that that's not something that anybody really has considered and, and doesn't know is important, so just please try to, you know, keep that in mind when you're going through stuff. Um, and so, you know, a large part of what we do at the BSC is data cleaning. Um, and so I've kind of referenced all of this, but, you know, we issue integrity queries, we go through the data, we make sure it's clean and it makes sense. Um, and so we're, we're trying to catch instances of fraud and misconduct as much as we can. Um, and there's, you know, some good signs in the system when things aren't done properly. And so that's a part of what we do, um, but it's also important that you guys pay attention to these things too. Um, and if something, again, um, was done wrong, then it's just something that's reported and, you know, it's not as big of a deal as you always might make it out to be. So 
um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but some important points with EDC um, really would be the use of source documents. So I know when you hear source documents, you kind of automatically think, you know, those stupid paper CRFs that we have to fill out. <laughs> you know, they're the things you print out and then they text boxes and it's just a paper. Well, what a source document actually really is, is the initial point of data collection for your study data. So if you have something like an ECG um, that comes out and, and there's um, ECG output um, through the you know, piece of paper that comes out, that's actually the source document. So if from that output you have your investigator review it and then complete a separate paper you know, CRF asking specific questions on it. You know, both of those are important to keep. So, you know, we've had instances where, you know, somebody has, you know, locator information, which an EDC um, or on your um, your source documents at your site would you would expect it to be uh, directly collected there, um, and if for some reason. You're conducting an interview with the participant, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't really understand what you're saying. And you give them a sticky note to write down their address. That actually becomes a source document. So that's something you can't throw away. So even though it may feel really silly, a sticky note in the participant's file, um, or in this case, in this PHI, you know, not there. <laughs> but, um, you know, you have to pay attention to where you're collecting data. and you know, the initial point of collection is something that's of concern and that's the data we want to make sure to keep. And that's the, the audit trail and the records that, you know, the FDA looks at and, and monitors look at during visits. Okay, so um, just as Denise um, had some scenarios and some audience participation, um, I also have that. So my first scenario um, is that we have a protocol monitor who comes out to your site. Uh, they discovered that there's some source documents missing for uh, the vital signs and one of the EDC questionnaires. Um, the site coordinator said, you know, even though the manual states that they're supposed to be a source document, I went ahead and did these um, entries direct data entry. So, um, so we have multiple choice in this case. And we'll see. Okay. And so um, the poll that will show up, um, you have two options. So the first one would be to recreate the source document. So you know that there's supposed to be a source for this assessment. And um, <coughs> excuse me, it was not done. Um, so you go ahead and recreate the source document. The other option would be to indicate on the progress note that an assessment was not done via direct data entry. So if you can go ahead and enter your response now. Okay, um, I think most of you have probably put your entries in on the poll, so I'm going to show the results. Okay, great. So, oh, there it is. So, um, so yep, it looks like most of you have the right answer. So it's important to just note that it was not done correctly. Um, you know, again, don't go back and create something. Um, just because you happen to do the process slightly wrong, um, it's okay. It's, it's just important to know that it was supposed to be done on a first document first before direct data entry. And so, um, so as you know, Denise has mentioned multiple times before, um, retrain on the issue. Make sure people know what the appropriate procedure is and to document the retraining. So, um, 
So again, yes, additionally, it's important to review your source document list during the study visit. So we have lists in typically the Advantage EDC User's Guide of what the source document is for each, um, for each assessment. Um, it's also sometimes in the forms book. And regardless of where you can find it, make sure you know where the source is for each assessment um, and, and really try to adhere to that. So again, the requirements for you know, paper source documents versus direct data entry. I know a good number of protocols now are trying to move towards the direct data entry approach. Um, and I think that's kind of you know, um, industry-wide. Um, it, it lessens the monitoring burden and you know, lessens the time that the coordinators have to spend collecting on two different points of, of, um, of data collection. So it's you know, important to pay extra attention when you're doing direct data entry. So we try to put a lot of warnings and pop-ups and things in the system to help you you know, not miss the decimal point, um, but you know, paying paying more attention because you're not going to have anything to refer back to if you're doing it that way. Um, and so, you know, with the other industry standard of moving towards things like medical record abstractions and electronic health records, um, you have to really look at where the source can be. So. You know, we have the, the things like the EPRO where it's a participant self-report. Um, we have, you know, RA interviews and then medical record extraction. So if it's noted that, you know, something's done um, on the medical record and you're supposed to look there, but for some reason it's not in place, you know, do, the option is not to go and ask the participant, hey, did you go to this, you know, clinic? Ah, about how long were you there for? And um, did you do this type of intervention? You know, that's collecting different types of data. And so in the end, when we go to do analysis, we can't use what the person said they did. Um, and some records comparing other records to, you know, actual data from, from the medical record. Um, so, so really paying attention to that is important and not trying to fill in your gaps with other sources. Um, without really verification from, you know, the lead teams or lead investigators that know, you know, know other things going on. So um, pay attention to that. And then again, if you do have a paper source document, um, it's a good to have some sort of process to make sure that what you have in EDC matches your source document. So I know a lot of sites will have their own QA process. So, you know, the coordinator one will go ahead and put the data entry in, and then coordinator two will go back and do, you know, 25% of those CRFs just to make sure that they're put in right. And if there's any errors, they elevate it to like 50%. And it's really not a, you know, a punitive process. It's just really important to, um, to just identify where issues might be and try to make things. Um, as clean as possible. So I have one more scenario. Um, so we are looking at the urine drug screen results. And so on your paper source document, you have um, the image above. And then an EDC, say your coordinator two, who's going through and doing your source doc verification, sees an uh, image on the bottom. So um, just to highlight the differences, you can see for methamphetamine um, values missing on the paper source and present on the EDC screen. Um, so I'm going to have another poll again. So it's important to kind of think about it. So there's two options. The first one would be to assume that because it's missing, it was negative. Um, the coordinator says, yeah, I'm, I remember this participant has never used meth. They've only used um, alcohol and marijuana, and this is not their drug of choice. So I, I'm, you know, I remember it being negative. Um, I'm going to go ahead and update my source document to reflect that. Um, and then your other option would be to just remove the value in advance GDC and submit, submit a missing value exception request. So please enter your answers. 
or choose your answer. Okay, great. So it looks like most of you have entered your results. Um, so, yep, the right answer is that you remove the value in EEC. Um, you know, as I kind of said earlier, it's not a big deal that we have that single missing point of data. If you think about how much data is collected, um, having that one missing value is not a huge deal, and it's more important to just have things accurately reflect um, what, you're, what, you're, um, what you've done and, and what's happened. So uh, the next scenario, um, so there is a substance use assessment that we expect to be direct data entry, um, but for some reason at the end of the day, the RA discovered that the assessment was not put in EDC, so the assessment was missing, um, and the participant uh, finished their visit early in the morning, so they're long gone, um, but it is the same day as the assessment was supposed to be collected. Um, so some information about this assessment. It is an RA administered interview, um, so it's something where the RA is supposed to sit down and talk to them and, and kind of ask them these questions. Um, based on the other assessments conducted with the participant, uh, the RA knows he did not use any substances during um, the past time frame and would know that he didn't use anything that he could mark all substances not, um, not used. So, uh, what would you do next? Uh, so your two options would be to complete the assessment in EDC saying no substance use um, because he knows from all the other assessments done that day that he was clean and did a great job the past week, um, or you could submit a missing form exception request. So please enter your results or your uh, answers. Great, so everybody said to submit a missing form exception request. Um, so again, no data is better than fraudulent data, um, even if it seems like something simple and you know the answer to and you know what it should have been. Um, it's better just to have it missing, and it's not a big deal. Okay, so one of my last scenarios um, kind of goes back to earlier in the presentation uh, that Denise did. So we have a protocol requirement relating to um, adverse events and SAEs. And so in this case, um, the following AEs will not require reporting EDC, but will be captured on the source document um, as medically indicated. So things that are grade one, which are mild and unrelated events, and um, has a little more information there. So we have a scenario where a participant presents with acid reflux. Um, is this something that's reportable in EDC? Please enter your answer. Okay, um, so it looks like the answers are kind of a little bit of both. Um, so I'm going to go back to what's stated in the protocol. Um, and as Denise mentioned earlier, always refer back to the protocol. Um, even if you think you have this section memorized, um, it's still good to go back and, and kind of reference it. So you can see here the following AEs will not require reporting in the data system but they will be captured on the source documentation. So um, acid reflux for the most part is a mild um, thing and highly unlikely that it's related. So in this case, it's not a reportable event in EDC, but it is reportable on your paper source document log, um, the AE log at the site. Um, so it's really you know, important to make sure that you're only doing things that the protocol tells you to um, and to follow 
in this case, the AE to make sure that the severity doesn't increase and elevate it since it is reportable in EDC. Um, so overall, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, some take-home messages. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of these we discussed already, but um, like I said, we want to do ongoing training, not just by the um, CCC and the DSC, but also at your sites, and then also document your training. Um, always use your um, reference provided materials. Refer to those, either the MOP or the user's guide or the um, Advantage GDC user's guide or data management handbook, um, also your protocol. And then um, we encourage you to ask questions and ask them often. That's what we're here for, to help you. And if we can't figure out the answer, we will find it out for you. Um, and yeah, I know if also like to know, I mean, if you're having this question, I, I know that everybody always says that, but if you're having the question, I can guarantee a lot of other people are too. And so if they're confused and they're not able to find it in the documents, um, we need to update them and make sure that everybody knows um, how to conduct the study in the same manner. Yeah, so and what we're here for is to, cr is to produce um, good data and a credible study. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're uh, using taxpayer money appropriately. So that's why we encourage you to always ask questions and, um, you know, to, to use the resources that you have. And this is the references that we used for uh, today's presentation for your um, information. If you and that is the hyperlink directly to the FDA warning letters. So, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments? If you wanted to ask your question about texting to the presenters, we really didn't address that earlier. And I think it may have related something to um, source documents. Um, so I think this person has indicated how you record texting. Um, I mean, I am not sure, you know, in what exact context it would be. Um, you know, we we try to only have approved communications with a participant um, based on your IRB regulations. So I think that's you know a large part of it. Um, you know, I, I think you know there's a lot of regulations around things like emailing a participant, um, that type of stuff. So, so you know, I would say follow those regulations. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, Lauren and um, Denise, thank you so much for presenting this, and hopefully everyone had fun, you know, um, participating in their own way. Um, we will make this presentation available on the CT and Dissemination Library's website, as we have with others. And uh, we, we will also issue our um, specific survey for your feedback. So an email will come from me, Tracy, uh, CTN Training at ms.com, and, uh, and I will uh, request you to complete the survey so we can give feedback to our presenters and also use that to improve our web seminar series. So I look forward to hearing from you then. Uh, we also encourage everyone to come back next month where we'll talk about closeout of studies and sites. And um, that will be on April 29th. An invitation will be sent shortly. So thank you for coming today. And um, thanks for your participation online. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Denise and Lauren, again.